Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, so, I've got two um, pleasure of giving two talks uh, now. So, the first one uh, is one of the associated uh, uh, fracture talks um, based on the transverse and the transverse posterior walls. So the transverse fracture is uh, an elementary type, and then the transverse posterior wall is an associated type. Um, and these two have been grouped together for a reason, because there are certain um, tips and tricks in the reduction technique which you can apply to both of these fractures. So the first talk will be on these, and the second talk will be on T-shaped fractures and associated with both column fractures. So the transverse fracture, the fracture line, as we've been talking about on, on x-rays, CTs, etc., divides the, the hemipelvis into two. So it divides it into a superior part with part of uh, the acetabulum and the dome, and then it divides it into an inferior part, which is, which is this, oops, which is this uh, ischiopubic segment. So that segment there is called the ischiopubic segment, and then that segment there is, is the intact um, bit attached to the rest of the hemipelvis, so the ileum and, and the superior part of the acetabulum. How common are these injuries? Well, in the meta-analysis by Giannoudis, these accounted for 8.3% of all acetabular fracture types. And as I've mentioned, the, the, fracture, the main fracture line divides the hemipelvis into two. Transverse fractures can be subdivided okay, into three subtypes, uh, into infratectal, juxtatectal, and transtectal. And these descriptions are in, re in relation to the condyloid fossa, the notch just there, and the articular surface. So the infratectal are below it, the juxtatectal are at the level of it, and the, and the trans, or the supertectal, go through the joint there. Through, through the weight-bearing part. So these, as you can imagine, are really, really critical to get right because these fractures are going through the weight-bearing part of the, of the dome and the acetabulum. When you think about the displacement of this fracture type, it's important to realize that the, the proximal fragment and the distal fragment can rotate in various planes. And if we look at the proximal fragment first, you can see that the proximal fragment here can externally rotate. If you look very closely, you may just see that there's a very slight opening of the SI joint there. Okay, and this is important to bear in mind when you're trying to reduce these fractures. The distal fragment can rotate in two planes. So if you, if you think about the proximal fragment and the distal fragment, the distal fragment can rotate in that plane, or it can rotate in that plane. And this is really important to appreciate as well when you're trying to reduce these fractures. If we look at this schematic diagram or sketch uh, of the intact acetabulum and then the transverse fracture pattern, we'll see that on the intact side, all the lines are the posterior wall, the anterior wall, the dome, the ilioischial line, the teardrop, the iliopectinal line are all intact, as you'd expect. If we look at the representation of the transverse fracture pattern, you can see that there's a disruption of the, the posterior wall, the anterior wall, the iliopectineal line, the dome, or well, the weight-bearing part, or well, most of it is where it should be. Part of it may have gone with this segment here, but the important thing to realize here is look at this relationship between the teardrop there, and the ilioischial line. That remains as it is. It's probably rotated in a bit, but the relationship between these two remains the same. And that's really important to, to realize, because when we look at T-fractures, you'll see that this relationship does change. So this here is an example of, um, of a, a transtectal transverse fracture. So there's the dome, uh, and you can appreciate that the the posterior wall is disrupted, the anterior wall is disrupted, the, uh, 
uh, iliopectineal line is disrupted, this relationship here that we talked about, the teardrop and the ilioischial line, they're maintained. The dome, or the majority of the dome, is where it should be, the rest of it has moved. It's really important to look at the other views and the things that we're really looking to pick up on the obturator view is to rule out any fractures here because if there is a, a potential fracture line going through here it may be a T-shaped fracture. The other thing to, to, to be aware of is the, is the posterior wall and the associated posterior wall. So you may well see a transverse fracture element with an associated posterior wall. The idea could be, gives us a lot of information as well. It gives us information about where the posterior column fracture line is. So is it high up here into the notch? And if you see that fracture line, then we're already thinking, hold on, what lies here? It's the superior gluteal. So is there a significant injury to the superior gluteal? Or certainly when we're trying to reduce this fracture, we've got to be extremely careful because we don't want to damage the superior gluteal artery. We've talked about this, but we'll mention it again because I think it's a really important concept to realize that actually on the, on the CT scan, on the axial cut of the CT scan, a transverse fracture line appears in that direction. So a vertical fracture line. It's been mentioned in, in the talk just uh, before, it was mentioned yesterday. That's important to, to understand that. <coughs> The CT scan will also tell you a few other things. It'll tell you about the displacement, whether the displacement is anterior or posterior. And this schematic representation here shows exactly what I, what I mean. So in this diagram on your left-hand side, you can see that there is, a, there is a hinge posteriorly, but there's an opening of the fracture anteriorly. And if you think about this, if we want to try and approach this, it may be worthwhile coming in anterior to try and clear up that fracture site, directly see that fracture site and reduce that fracture site directly, okay? Because if we go in from the back, you'll see that intact hinge. Periosteum may still be intact as well, so you'll find it essentially undisplaced or minimally displaced fracture. So you'll be at the wrong end of the fracture. If we look at uh, the, the opposite, so where the fracture opens up posteriorly, you see the hinge is anterior. And for this particular fracture type, you'd want to be posterior. So you can clear out the fracture site, reduce it, and, and hold it with your fixation. The treatment for the majority of transverse fractures is through the Cochalangamek approach. We've, we've heard about that. Um, you've heard about the approach, you've seen the approach, you've set up uh, patients, etc. this morning. There are various aids and techniques to try and help you reduce these fractures. And you're going to be doing the workshops uh, tomorrow, so we'll talk about reduction aids and reduction tools and instrumentations, etc. But some of the things that can really help you uh, are a shank spin into the issue, which can, which, which can help you derotate the fragment and move it to where you want it. Uh, uh, various clamp or offset clamps can be very, very helpful. And then a hook into the cytic foramen, uh, cytic foramen to help you, again, control uh, any displacement inferiorly and any rotation as well. These can be extremely helpful reduction tools. And a combination of these, um, or, 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 or them on their own, can be very, very helpful. It's important when you're contouring the plate, so when you think about it, when you, when you do the practical exercise next to the posterior wall, you will see that with a posterior wall, um, you probably want to under contour the plate a little bit because you really want to push down on that posterior wall fragment and compress it down. Whereas with a transverse fracture, you want to do the opposite. You want to uh, you want to over contour the plate because if you if you leave it under contoured or or exactly contoured, that's what will happen. The anterior fracture line will open up. So what you want to do is to over contour the plate. Because when the plate snugs down, when you tighten up the screws, it actually causes compression of the anterior fracture line. And this is beneficial. This is what we want. So what's the evidence? What should we do? And what, how should we fix these fractures? Well, there's a study in 2009 which looked at um, 
whether the anterior column needed to be fixed or not. So they looked at uh, uh, a series of cases where they plated the posterior column uh, for transverse fractures, and in half of them they put an anterior column screw, and in the other half they didn't. And what they showed is certainly their, their radiological and clinical outcome was no different. So what they concluded from that is that if you can get an acceptable reduction of the anterior column through the posterior approach, then you may, may not need to fix it with an anterior column screw. Okay? But then you look at these two other studies here. So that one in 2001 uh, and that one in 1998. And they looked at uh, various different uh, configuration of implants. And the first one looked at uh, a posterior column plate versus an anterior and a posterior uh, column lag screws. And what they found is that a posterior column plate was much stronger than lag screws anteriorly and posteriorly. This study here looked at uh, a posterior column plate with an anterior column screw, and it looked at two other configurations, and it, it showed that a posterior column plate with an anterior column screw is probably the, the strongest construct. That, so that's what we should be aiming for. What's the outcome in this group of patients? Well, certainly for the transverse fractures, Matter showed in his series that with an 89% anatomical reduction, he had a 56% excellent result, 33% good, 11% fair. In Bircher's series, which uh, he followed up uh, 160 or so cases for about 10 years, he found that he was able to achieve anatomical reduction in just under 70% of cases, and he has had 75% excellent rate. So talk you through uh, an example of a transverse fracture. So, one thing, one thing I didn't mention actually about the transverse fracture patterns is if you think about the, the infratectal, the juxtatectal, the transtectal, the fracture inclination or the direction of the fracture line changes with each of these as well. And you'll find that the infratectal fracture is pretty transverse. A juxtatectal fra fracture is more oblique like so. And the transtectal fracture is even more steep and oblique like so, and going right back up towards the, um, uh, the SI joint and the greater sciatic notch. So this is an example of a, uh, of a juxtatectal transverse fracture. Uh, you can see that most of the dome is in place. The anterior and posterior walls have been disrupted. The iliopectineal line has been disrupted there. The relationship between the teardrop and the ileoischial line is still maintained. The hip uh, uh, has been uh, uh, directed medially. Some CT scans. Um, uh, and what you won't appreciate from these CT scans, but what I didn't have the axial cuts, but essentially the anterior part of the fracture line had opened up, more so than the posterior line, as I explained in that schematic diagram. So I looked at the CT scans and thought, well, you know, how am I going to approach this? And I thought the majority of the displacement was anterior, and hence I went anterior first and put a, uh, an anterior column plate, two screws there and two screws there. Uh, I could still feel um, a little bit of a hinge posteriorly, so I, I did flip the patient and go posteriorly as well. And when I went posteriorly, the fracture line, as I, as I predicted, was very, very low. And essentially, uh, that bit was what I could feel, um, just there. And I fixed that with two um, lag screws there. So in summary, transverse fracture lines, what do they do? They break the hemipelvis into two segments, a superior and an inferior segment. And it's important to realize that these can be displaced anteriorly or posteriorly or both. These are usually dealt with through the Popper Langebeck approach. There are various fixation methods, as we've talked about, um, and we've talked about the outcome as well. So now what we'll do is move on to the transverse posterior wall. So the transverse posterior wall, again in two series, accounts for between 70 and 21 percent of vascular fractures. The problem with this is the outcome. You look at that outcome. 29%, 30% excellent outcome at 10 years. That's a pretty poor 
prognosis for these fractures. It, these are a bit more difficult than, the, than just the transverse, and there's important decision-making processes that, that help you decide you know, what you should do with them and which approach you should use as well. And usually, for most of these, if the displacement is posterior, you'd use a proper Langham Beck approach. Unless something tells you different. So there's high energy or there's displacement anteriorly. The complicating factors when you look at a transverse posterior wall are the level of the transverse fracture line. And we've talked about this. You can have an infratectal, juxtatectal, transtectal fracture line. The nature of the posterior wall fragment. So if it's just a, uh, an isolated single uh, piece posterior wall, it may be okay. But if it's of the extended posterior wall variety, where it goes right back to the, the posterior column and there's, there's no cortical read um, of the posterior column, that might be more difficult to reduce us through this approach. And if you've got an associated pelvic ring injury, you may need to think about an alternate approach. So here we have um, the infratectal transverse fracture, the posterior wall, infratectal, uh, sorry, uh, juxtatectal transverse fracture, and both of these can be approached through a posterior wall, uh, through a posterior approach. This one here is the transtectal fracture, and you can see the fracture line is much more vertical. It involves the weight-bearing portion of the acetabulum, the dome there. And you can appreciate that trying to visualize, you can you probably feel most of this through the copper lamp bed. You're not going to be able to directly see the reduction. Not all of it anyway, through the copper lamp bed. The extended posterior wall. So this is the second subtype, which may uh, make you decide to use an alternative approach. And this is where you have um, uh, a large or multifragmentary posterior wall where it, in, in, where it, goes, it goes very close to the posterior column. There may well be a, a segment out of the posterior column there. And hence, you won't have any way of trying to piece all these things back. You won't have anything intact to piece all these things back to. You, you may be doing things indirectly. Um, you certainly won't get a cortical read of, of the anterior, anterior fracture line and the reduction. So you may well choose to use a different approach for this. And then you have the, sub, uh, the third subcategory, so uh, the transverse posterior wall with the potential SI joint injury or a symphysial injury. And if you look at this extra here, you can see that the left hip doesn't look congruent. It's uh, subluxed or dislocated. Um, and then if you, if you look at the eye of faith, there may be something heading up in that direction. If you look at the uh, iliac oblique, you can see that there is a faint line going up in that direction. You get a CT scan and it confirms <coughs> what you thought. There is a sacroiliac joint injury associated with this transverse fracture. So this will need stabilization of the SI joint and treatment of the transverse fracture also. So you need to think about two approaches. Although this one was all done with the patient pro. So what are the surgical options for these complex fracture patterns? Well, certainly, if you've got a fracture uh, transtectal transverse or a transtectal transverse with a posterior wall, which is extended, then you've got to think about using something else. So you may think about using two approaches, an anterior and a posterior approach. You may think about using an extended iliofemoral approach for these cases. Or you may try and extend or your copper Langenbeck approach by doing a surgical dislocation of the hip so that you can actually visualize the, um, the articular surface and visualize the, the reduction of the anterior and the posterior columns from the inside by dislocating the hip. So here's a case of a, a, a transverse with posterior wall, which is of the extended variety. And there it looks pretty innocuous. It doesn't look too bad. Um, you can see the couple of posterior wall fragments there. You can see that the hip is subluxed, dislocated. Um, you can see that there's a, a break in the uh, aliopectinal line, aliopectinal line. That relationship has been maintained. When you look at the, when you look at the CT, you can see this is just this is more than just a, a, post, a simple posterior wall. It's in a few bits. That 
there's another fracture line going there, which makes that bit segmental. Uh, there's a large posterior wall there, there's another posterior wall element there. So this made me think, well, hold on, you know, I, I don't think I can do all of this through one approach easily. So what I did in that case is did a, a limited anterior approach uh, with an anterior plate, two screws on either side, and then I flipped the patient and did a posterior approach. And you can see the various screws into the various posterior wall and column elements. I used a uh, buttress type uh, T-plate from the foot set to try and uh, buttress that back. And I used the posterior column plates as well. And there's the iliac plate. So the patient who has an SI joint injury, again, this patient is one of the complex transverse posterior wall fracture varieties. And this needs a little bit of thought as well. And in this case, you may think about using a combined approach or an acetabular approach and a pelvic approach, or you may be able to do everything through one like I did with the other case and use a, uh, use, well, keep the patient prone, but do a coffin langebeck approach and think about putting in percutaneous SI screws. So this case here, um, both sides have been injured. You can see that there's a, uh, a, a juxtatectal T-shape, because it's gone through there, with a posterior wall on the right, uh, uh, an infratectal with a posterior wall on the left. If you look very carefully, look at that SI joint. Slightly rotated, it's slightly wider there than it is there. Look at the other views, so the obliques, uh, the inlets and the outlets. Um, with the eye of faith, you, you're thinking that the, the, if there's an anterior injury, you're looking for a posterior injury. So then that with the eye of faith looks a, a little bit wider, and then you get a CT scan, and it confirms what you thought. So now you're dealing with a combined injury, okay, so a pelvic ring injury, plus a, plus a, a transverse posterior wall. And this needs combined approaches, okay? And this is what I did. I didn't do everything on one day. I did um, this side, the pelvic ring, and the, and the right side on one day, and I came back and did the left side on the next day. And these are the weeks. So, in conclusion, the transverse and the transverse posterior wall fractures, they can be grouped together because the reduction techniques, etc., uh, are similar. Most of them can be approached through the posterior Cochlear-Langebeck approach. However, you need to think about the more complex fracture patterns, okay, so the extended posterior wall, the ones where you've got a, a transtectal fracture, or the ones where you've got a combined pelvic and acetabular injury. Those you may need to think about doing dual approaches or doing extensile approaches. But remember, this group of patients has an extreme full prognosis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask for